It's a great honor and indeed a privilege for me for the first time to introduce Mr. Rod Taylor as our new leader. I've introduced him many times before, but never as the leader of the Christian Heritage Party. Yeah. So it's my delight to um, uh, to be able to do this introduction for my, Duke, uh, my great friend, traveling companion, over <laughs> several weeks of my time as interim leader, I was on the road with my traveling companion. And we were the Lone Ranger in Toronto, or whatever you want to say. Uh, we had a great time together, traveling uh, throughout uh, Alberta from the north to the south, and then into northern BC, and then into southern BC later. And uh, the only place he didn't travel with me was on this last trip to Saskatchewan, and of course my time traveling around Manitoba. But he was also with me in Ontario, where it all began for me. And so, over the course of time, I've grown to, to love and appreciate Rod and Elaine. Uh, we, I've been up there uh, in their uh, hometown of Telqua, visiting with them, staying with them in their home, enjoying their hospitality. And, uh, and by the way, uh, just in case you thought you were eating chicken tonight, I was really about it. Now, I, I want you to know that not only is he a great leader, but he's a, a servant leader, a sacrificial leader. You know that he butchered his last rabbits just so that we can enjoy? And did, did it taste like chicken? Like really, seriously, did it taste like chicken? Oh, I know. But, now, I was asking if he was going to bring a, a rabbit's foot, and he said, well, I wasn't looking for the rabbit, why would I carry a rabbit's foot? But, whatever the case, um, Rod and Lane uh, are a wonderful uh, first couple for the Christian Heritage Party. I know that they will represent us well, and uh, it's so wonderful in this kind of a gathering to have our new leader address you, all of us as uh, members and as delegates, and for him to share whatever uh, God has put on his heart to share. And, and I know that having this kind of a musical introduction by the torchman to someone that's going to be carrying the torch for the CHP moving on, we want to give him our attention I want to welcome him to this podium tonight as our new leader, your new leader, Mr. Rod Taylor. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, of course it's been my, my privilege and pleasure as well to travel with, uh, travel with David. You know, before I uh, launch into what I want to say tonight uh, to you, and I'm really appreciative of the opportunity, it seems like I've had uh, several golden opportunities already to address you during this convention, and tomorrow morning we have the, the candidate uh, training, which we'll be involved with as well. But before I do that, I, I want to uh, ask, um, the deputy leader to come up here for a minute, uh, Peter Vogel. And uh, I don't know if anybody has been wondering uh, what's going to happen uh, at, at the convention as far as well, who's going to carry the torch as the deputy leader. Well, I have noticed that we have a pretty good deputy leader right now. So, so I want to uh, just, just tell you it's, it's uh, my, my intention to lean on this young man, and I have already been leaning on him to a large extent, and I really appreciate uh, Peter. He's been doing a great job as a deputy leader, as a vice president, as doing all kinds of tasks, and uh, I want to, just want to tell you that that's my intention, to walk with this man. Yeah. Thank you. What I want to uh, share tonight, I'm going to start with a, a passage from Psalm 78, verse 9. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. And in verse 41 it says, Yes, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember His hand, nor the day when He delivered them from the enemy. We, as God's people, as Canadians, as members of the CHP, have so much for which to be thankful. 
And God desires that we remember what He has done for us, that we remember with gratitude His provision, His protection, His guidance, His anointing, and His favor. Because God does not change. He says of Himself, I, the Lord, change not. The writer of the book of Hebrews tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Spirit that motivated and informed the prophets and empowered David and Samson, the same God that spared just Lot and took Joseph from prison to a place of honor and authority, the same God who shut the mouths of lions, divided the Red Sea, fed the 5,000, and raised our Lord Jesus from the dead, that God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. We are completely equipped. We lack nothing. From time to time, God's children have forgotten that. The Israelites trapped between Pharaoh's army and the Red Sea had forgotten. Saul and his army, trembling before Goliath, had forgotten. The ten unbelieving spies who discouraged God's people from entering the Promised Land had forgotten that the living God, the one who formed the heavens and the earth, was able to make a way for them through the wilderness, through the fire, through the showers of hostile arrows. And, and uh, so the children of, Israel, of Ephraim, although they were fully armed, and although they were carrying bows, had forgotten. The book says that they had what they needed. They had what it took to engage the enemy and to succeed. But they turned back in unbelief and limited the holy God of Israel. So how can a human being limit the limitless God? By unbelief. We read in the New Testament, even our Lord Jesus did not do many miracles in his own hometown because of their unbelief. When Moses sent the 12 spies in to spy out the land, 10 said that God was not big enough to keep his promise. They turned back and limited the holy God of Israel. Two of them said, let's go up at once. We're well able to overcome it and to possess it because our God is with us. But the ten rebelled and the ten prevailed. They refused to believe God and they refused to obey God. They used their mouths to undermine the faith of the people and they spoke words of unbelief. They turned back and limited the holy God of Israel. But was it only the ten that suffered for their unbelief? No. Sadly, they dragged their nation down with them. The people who had seen the Red Sea parted and had seen God's mighty hand delivering them from Pharaoh's bondage were drawn away into unbelief, and they all wandered in the desert for 40 years. Even Joshua and Caleb, the men of faith, the men who were ready to believe and obey, even they had to wander in the desert for 40 years when they might have gone straight into their inheritance. We walk by faith, not by sight. The ten saw the giants and said, we can't. The two saw God's ability and said, we can. Forty years later, those two received their reward and they went in and possessed the land. Brothers and sisters in the Christian Heritage Party, we have been kept from our purposes for 28 years. Not as long as the children of Israel, but some of us are getting tired of wandering in the desert. desert. Some of us are getting tired of the taunting of the giants. And we have men and women, brothers and sisters, who share the name of Christian, Christ followers, who share our eternal destiny as sons and daughters of the Most High God, and yet they have weakened the hands and shaken the confidence and undermined the faith of some of our CHP members. I'm talking about those outside the party who have refused to join us. We have had good members who have grown weary in well-doing. They've pulled the pin, thrown in the towel, they've turned back and limited the Holy God of Israel. And it has hurt to see them go. It has hurt to hear them say, I just don't think the CHP is ever going to get in. Every one of our members who has abandoned the cause and given up the fight has weakened the hands of another member, just as surely as every divorce puts pressure on the marriages around it. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Those who use their words to build up and encourage our candidates, our EDA teams, and our provincial councils 
are worth their weight in gold. We appreciate you, and a lot of you in this room, everyone in this room that's bothered to come to convention is someone who uh, has really blessed the hearts of those in leadership. And on the other hand, those who have used their words to tear down and discourage the soldiers in the trenches have done more harm than our political opponents. It hurts more. But we, we must not follow that example. We must not turn back and limit the work of God. We must remind our brothers and sisters, our spiritual leaders and teachers, that we serve a mighty God. We serve a risen Savior. We serve a righteous cause. As men of old, we fight for our families, for our children, for the lives of the precious unborn, and for the freedom and dignity of those not yet conceived. Every citizen who has been paying attention to the agonizing downward spiral of Western society over the past 20 years or more has clearly seen the negative impact of bad laws on families and communities and, and has hoped to be able to do something to make a difference. True, not all of our citizens agree on the root causes of our descent into anarchy and depravity. Some even blame religion for our fractured culture. But as Christians, we understand that the solution to our social ills is not to abandon God, but to return to biblical principles. As the battle for our culture intensifies, so our responsibility increases to declare biblical truth in the face of hostile attacks from secular media and an entrenched bureaucracy. For too long, we have allowed our fellow citizens to be hoodwinked by a self-serving elite who have controlled the flow of information in the media, stymied reasonable efforts to offer responsible alternatives. It's clear that the ability even to train our own children in biblical standards of righteousness is now being challenged in the courts. The separation of church and state, for so long the pet phrase of anti-Christian zealots, has become a paper-thin barrier between churches and the activists who want the state to dictate hiring practices, acceptable sermon material, and the scope of teaching in regard to lifestyles and behavior. The critical balance of human affairs in our day cannot be overemphasized. Like pickup sticks, our interactions within our spiritual communities and the ability of God's people to be, as Reverend Lawrence R White says, the stinging salt that stops decay and the pure shining light that shows the way for our nation will either persuade, that interaction will either persuade men to change course or at least will provide a prophetic witness to their rebellion. Because of the sacrifices and the focus of our founders and the persistence of our committed members, we have not been swept away by the political gully washers of the past 28 years. When other parties have morphed and changed their spots and changed their platforms to accommodate the media-driven drivel and the left-wing lunacy of our times, the CHP has stood firm. In spite of the glitz and glamour, the clamour and the hammer of phony human rights pretensions, animal rights predilections, and global warming alarmists and drug-promoting pharmacists and barely-thinking disarmaments, we are still here. Our Bible has not changed, our mandate has not changed, our God has not changed. But our nation has changed, and for the worse. Public classrooms have gotten darker. The demands of the ungodly have gotten louder. The shamelessness of the wicked has become more evident, and much of the church has gotten quieter. The cost of obedience has gotten higher. We have a debt to witness for our God and to declare his judgments in the streets. Failure to testify to his purpose today is no kindness to our neighbor. For the awful price of our disobedience is a wretched harvest of sorrow and regret for a nation plunged into an abyss of darkness and horror. But we, but we in the Christian Heritage Party of Canada 
still hold a legitimate place among the parties of this land. We still have access to the public forums, although some of our candidates have been hindered as they sought to take their rightful places. We still have the right to have a candidate on the ballot followed by the words Christian Heritage Party, while the ungodly gnash their teeth. We still have a right to letters in the paper and flyers in the mailboxes and ads on the radio. History has shown us so clearly that if we fail to exercise those rights, we will forfeit them in time. It may be quickly, almost overnight, as has happened in every dictatorial police state, in Hitler's Germany, in Stalin's Russia, in Castro's Cuba, in Mao's China, in Pol Pot's Cambodia, in Idi Amin's Uganda, in any of the nasty and brutish Islamic nations where human decency has given way to lawless tyranny. Or it may happen more slowly, as rights are forfeited by default, one by one, until there are no rights left. God has made us in his image. He has given us his authority to speak in his name, to speak to our children, to speak to our fellow believers, to speak to our generation even those who do not know our God, to speak truth to the institutions of power and to bring God's perspective to the great decisions of our day. We have been anointed and equipped to sit in the gates of the city among the elders of the land, like Lot in Sodom, like Jeremiah and the other prophets in ancient Jerusalem, like Niemöller and Bonhoeffer in Germany, like Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn in Russia, or like Churchill in pre-war Britain. We may not always be heeded, but we may always be heard. The prophet Ezekiel spelled it out for us. When we see disaster coming, we must blow the trumpet and warn the city. We must exercise all our persuasion and all our force to warn the people and to avert calamity. If we are heeded, it shall be good for that city and good for that nation. If we are ignored and despised, the nation will perish in its ignorance and its rebellion, but we at least will have delivered our soul. The institutions of our decadent society which have grown up around us will not be dis diminished by half-hearted efforts. The spiritual forces of darkness which have unleashed discord, discontent, pleasure-seeking selfishness and rebellious idolatry in our nation, in our courts, in our media, in our universities, these atheistic philosophies and man-centered worldviews will not be easily expelled and they will not go quietly. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. This is no time for surrender, compromise, or appeasement. This is a time for principled, unflinching, unapologetic leadership. This is a time for declaring the things that are not as though they were, for speaking into being the kind of society our God desire, desires, and for breathing life into it. Son of man, what do you see? A valley of dry bones. This is the army of the living God. Across this land, our churches, our families, our young people as a whole, have not been involved in the work of the CHP. Of course, I don't mean any of you who are here, your families and your churches. I thank God for every one of you who have kept the faith, have held on to the vision, and have passed on your passion to your children. But in this nation, the vast majority of people who want the same things we want, safety, morality, and justice, have not yet caught the vision, have not dared to dream with us the dream that Canadian Christians can rise up, be united, and make a difference. They have not yet realized that they have a responsibility before God for changing this nation and for leaving a legacy for their children. Or if they do realize it, they have not yet seen the CHP as the vehicle for serving the nation. So what does God call the prophet Ezekiel to do? He says, speak to the bones. We know the bones the skeletons of wasted hopes and dreams, of abandoned principles and compromised social values. We know the bones are many, and we know they're very, very dry. Wish I could go down very dry. <laughs> 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 the, 
There is no life in them because there's no life in compromise. God has not established his kingdom for us to barter it away, like Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. No. Nope. God commanded Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones and to declare to them his intentions. Now we do not have the power to give life, nor the power to change hearts, but we have been called by God to speak to our generation, to speak to the compromised and the compromising church, to speak to our lost and wandering friends and neighbors, to speak to the rotting institutions and of our crumbling society, and to declare God's intentions to uproot that which is contrary to his purposes and to build and plant and nurture that which springs from his heart. That which resonates with his written and spoken word, that which edifies mankind and honors our creator. Speak to these bones and declare that God is calling them to life. We have the honor of being used by God to bring his principles, his character, and his good plans for mankind, first to those who profess to know him, and then to the people of this hurting nation. In Canada today, we have seniors struggling to make ends meet. In Canada today, we have veterans who wonder if their sacrifices have even been appreciated. We have children generations of them who have been the victims of easy divorce and have been denied the benefit of a secure home with two loving parents. We have young people who have been persuaded to accept massive debt as the natural cost of education. We have more and more people who have discovered that freedom of speech, freedom of association, and freedom of religion are only an illusion. We have families who have lost loved ones to vicious and senseless murders, stabbings, rapes, who have discovered after years of painful court proceedings that the blood of their loved ones, although it cries out for justice, seems to have no value to the methodical and musty minions of the court system. Their loved ones' bones are thrown on the ash heaps of history. They see no justice has been done for the past. No prevention has been implemented for the future. We have legions of unhappy young people who have been taught that life has no eternal purpose, who have been deceived into seeking physical pleasure as a substitute for spiritual health. We have legions of young men and women who have been deceived and seduced to sacrifice their firstborn to Moloch, to the pleasure-seeking, self-gratifying God of this age. Though they have tried so hard to believe the lies that they've been told, their conscience has not been assuaged and their pangs of remorse have not been quieted. Our nation is racked by violence, yet our politically correct statisticians tell us that violent crime is decreasing. By redefining crime and reducing conviction, convictions and shortening sentences, the real numbers are hidden. We're told that things are getting better, but no sane person can believe that. How many mass shootings in schools took place in the 50s, 60s, and 70s? How many murder-suicides? How many Mounties were shot by deranged and lonely gunmen while we were growing up? I'm speaking to those of my age. Precious few. But now our land is tainted with murder, rebellion, and tragedy. Even without the shootings, the stabbings, and the mayhem of street violence and domestic violence, our nation is polluted with innocent blood, the blood of 100,000 children every year. We lament together with our nation the tragedy of a schoolyard shooting, but we allow the deliberate killing of 4,000 classrooms full of children every year. In fact, we support it with our tax dollars. We provide the ammunition, and their blood cries out from the ground. We tell children that human life has no value, and then we tell them that they need more self-esteem. We tell them that mankind is only a random species on a random planet with no meaning and no purpose. And then we tell them they should feel good about themselves, feel good about others, and must not say anything that could make someone else feel badly. One quarter of their would-be classmates have been killed in the womb. But the survivors are apparently so fragile we mustn't trouble them with truth. Sometimes it would be easy to give up. It would be easy to give in. The road to victory is not an easy road. 
I'm glad that God gave us the prophets as examples. Their words were rejected. Their prophecies were disputed. Their characters were maligned. Their bodies were abused. Some of them were stoned and sawn asunder. They walked in righteousness, knowing that the righteous judge who tries the hearts of men will justify them in his time. Modern prophets have tasted from the same cup of suffering and of disappointment. There is a pain in rejection, and I think we've all felt it in the CHP. We all wonder, how long? How long will men love darkness rather than light? How long before our warnings will be heeded? How long and what will it take before our brothers will join us in the fight and stand with us in the battle? What will it take to bring this nation to its knees, to awaken the sleeping church, and to mobilize the dry bones of the mighty army of the living God? When Winston Churchill spoke to his nation at the outset of World War II, he did not make rosy promises. He did not make lofty and optimistic claims. His warnings had been ignored for years, his call to action disregarded, and he himself despised. But when reality could no longer be denied and the grim approach of war could no longer be postponed, his countrymen called on him to lead them to muster their armies, and by the grace of God, to preserve their island home against a brutal and relentless foe. When he stood to call the nation to the battle line, he did not seek to minimize the difficulties and the dangers which they faced. He told them, I can promise you nothing but blood and sweat and toil and tears. And so it was. But their island nation survived. Now, we don't have airplanes waiting to bomb our cities, not that we know of. And there is no mighty nation mining our harbors or advancing over our borders with tanks and shells. At least, we hope not. But the terrors facing the world and the tyrants threatening our children are no less real and no less savage. This is a call to arms and a call to sacrifice. I can promise no easy victory. I can promise no sudden success. Around the globe, the sun seems to be setting over troubled seas and restless, tragic cities. We have solutions to many of the world's problems, better solutions based on truth and based upon our unshakable conviction that the same God who made the world, who made us and placed us here for his glory, that same God has plans for us, plans for you and me, and plans for Canada, plans for good and not for evil plans to give us a future and a hope. The, the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back and limited the Holy One of Israel. They were armed, but they acted as if they were unarmed. God has given us everything we need to win the spiritual battle for our nation. Knowing this, we must not turn back. We must not turn back from our purpose, nor limit God in his mighty power. My friends, I ask for your continued commitment to this cause. I ask for your ongoing sacrifice of time, energy, passion, prayers, and support. I ask you to endure with me for a time the rejection of our friends who have not yet seen the hand of God at work in the CHP. I ask you to stand with me and answer the shallow accusations of secularism and face with me the hazards of confronting militant terrorism, the shadow of which has now begun to fall on our land. The road ahead may not be easy, but in due time we will re reap a reward yes. if we do not faint. Ahead of us looms a general election for which we must be prepared. We need candidates who will pour it all out for the cause. We need campaign team members who will knock on doors, even if their knees knock first. Yeah. <laughs> we need donors who will continue to give even when their neighbor tells them they're wasting their time. We need EDA boards and provincial councils who will make it their business to encourage their members and recruit new ones. In short, we need you to continue doing what you're doing. 
and by your example to demonstrate faith in action and bring kingdom principles to Canadian politics. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your willingness to allow me the unbelievable privilege of carrying the CHP banner, the torch, the baton at this crossroads of history. I commit to you my intent to do that with all my heart as long as God gives me strength. Thank you for being here and thank you for making a difference for Canada and for the CHP. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, our new leader. Inspiring presentation, wasn't it? Thank you, Rod, and looking forward to much more and uh, to following in your footsteps as our trustee leader.